Episode, another episode. Hi, another episode coming down the pipe, flying down the pipe at you right here, right now, right here, right now. I'll tell you a little something about that song. That song is called "Right Here, Right Now," and I think is that by oh, right here. I think I know it, but I'm scared to say it because that's a big one. Oh, it's Fatboy Slim. Okay. I was wrong. I thought, who is, what's the song by Jesus Jones? It's called, wait, who wrote right here, right now? Mike Edwards. What the, what? Which one is it? Is it the same band or something? Am I stupid? jesusjones.com the headline of that when you google it is jesus jones no we didn't split up come and find out what dot 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 i don't think i'll be finding out but i am stoked for them okay i think they wrote that song everyone knows that song it's like right here right now but who did always something there to remind me always something there to remind me naked eyes Oh, this looks like a good music video. Maybe I'll check that out later. What's up, y'all? I'm Burston Maroney. This is the Bottle Rocket Company podcast. And baby, we just cruise around here. So buckle up. Get it. Get your get your snack of choice. And we're hitting the road. Open road. And we're not coming back anytime soon. So shut up. Stop complaining about it. We'll come back later. But for right now, it's the podcast. Um, Guys, I'm so so pumped about the episode today that you guys are about to listen to we had my good friend and a mentor figure on the podcast today his name is steve rabalski everybody go crazy wherever you are listening go wild for him go off and go wild for him um steve is an incredible person Steve is the head of A and R. No, Steve is the president of Canvas Back Records, which is the record label that I am so very, very lucky to work with. Um, I've known Steve a couple of years now, and we have developed a great relationship through our time working on music together. He has been a very, very kind and loving hand in a world that can be supposedly really crazy. I have been very lucky to have good experiences and be surrounded by kind thoughtful people uh in my music in my music time and steve has been on the forefront of that he's really kind of set the bar of what a person who is in a position of authority or maybe has a lot of power in my mind he's set the bar of um of decency that comes along with that someone who is who's at the head of something uh, and he he's someone who's at the head of something but still chooses to um, be incredibly kind to people. Um, and I think that's really cool. And I love him. And boy, he, <laughs> this is tough for me to admit, but it seems like he has a lot of love for me because this whole time that we were talking, he was giving me amazing compliments and they made me very nervous. And you can tell in this episode that though I've known Steve for a long time, we've been through a lot and we've had hard conversations and quick, funny conversations and all sorts of conversations. I still get nervous when he is so sweet on me. He's sweet, sweet, sweet on me. Sweet like sugar, which, um, if you Google that, let's see what comes up. Sweet like sugar. Oh, you're, you have to be absolutely kidding me. That is, um, a really common phrase and a type of berry berry gin (laughs) berry and jenny's ice cream cookie dough core ben ben and jerry's ice cream sweet like sugar cookie dough core 
So it only has 4.8 out of 5 stars, and that's because one person gave it a one-star review. And let's see why they did that. Why would they do that? Man, there are a lot of really good reviews on this. Um, on this. Guys, I'm playing... I'm getting the opportunity to play a show tonight uh, for the first time with my side project band called the $500,000. And we're playing a socially distanced event this evening, and I'm really, really excited. Okay, so this is a two-star review on Ben and Jerry's Sweet Like Sugar Cookie Dough Ice Cream Dough Core. This person says, It has taken me over a month just to finish Ben and Jerry's Sweet Like Sugar Cookie Dough Ice Cream. It is everything the title says it is, but I misread it in the store. I was rushing. It tastes like sugar cookie with a couple pieces of cherries here are there. <laughs> I wouldn't buy it again since the pairing is a total miss for my taste buds. Doug, can we open up the conversation about people who give stuff bad reviews but admit that it's their fault that they don't like it? <laughs> oh, that's so funny to me, man. Because it's, it's such a common fucking thing that happens for whatever reason. People just do that they review stuff and then they like don't they just like will openly admit that it's just their fault which is not a bad thing but damn grow up guys i'm super stoked for you to listen to this episode sorry if i seem a bit nervous in it i was a bit nervous i get nervous in every fucking episode so um yeah steve is an amazing guy and i think you're gonna learn a lot about how to um <laughs> I don't fucking know I'm not gonna tell you what you're gonna learn but Steve says some really really wise things in this episode and it was really fun to listen back uh and to hear his conviction um for what he does and he's been doing it for a while and um has had some great success being a person person who leads with um his passion so that being said let's fire it up get into this episode together as one as one unit as a family um and then that's what will happen cool all right <laughs> two stars worst flavor by far <laughs> that's another funny one okay enjoy y'all back well that was easy wasn't it zoom zoom magic <laughs> The, the the greatest part of that is no one listening to this is going to know what I just dragged myself through to figure this out. The internal battle that went on to get to this point. God, but yeah. it's worth it. Art ain't easy. That, Art ain't easy. You are telling me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hit this little red button on my phone. Okay. And we're off. Let's do it. Welcome. To the bottom, thank you. To the, Happy to be here. Thank you. Would you like to introduce yourself to start things off? My yes. My, my name is Steve Ralbowski, and I have the distinct pleasure of uh, working with Briston, uh, and along with Chris Klein, uh, had the distinct pleasure of uh, uh, signing Briston to Canvasback uh, Music and Atlantic Records uh, uh, a few moons ago. Mm. Uh, um, and uh, uh, tend to occupy a, uh, a role to help kind of guide and advise and support and advocate on uh, all the creative stuff and uh, all the marketing sort of stuff as well and work closely with, uh, with the team around Briston. And um, yeah, Ec how's that? Fantastic. Uh, and, and we'll chop it up. Like I said, you know, we'll make yeah. it sound, make it sound yeah. great. <laughs> no, man, that's, I think that's a wonderful description um, of the role I have been lucky to have uh, in my life. Um, advocate is my favorite word that you said, because I feel like from the jump, we have always um, done a really great job of, of having collaborative conversations on everything um that goes on in the world what we work on together um I'm, i must say one of the things when i think back about the time when we met 
was how much trust and faith you, um, you know, you, you bestow, you gave to us, you know, when Chris had first played me your music, um, he was very new to his job mm. and was leaving Nashville, which had been his home for a number of years and moving to New York to take a job at the big headquarters company and going to work for, for me. And, you know, we'd had all of one meeting, you know, right. but he made an awesome, he made an awesome, uh, mixtape, so to speak. <laughs> and one of the first things that he showed me was some, some of your songs and told me this amazing story about how his last night in town before he moved to New York to the big city to take this big ass new job mm. that he went to see you play somewhere. And, um, you know, he, he wasn't the, he wasn't the kind of guy that wanted to show up with the five things that his last boss wouldn't let him sign, you know? Um, but I really liked the songs that he played me of yours. Oh. And first we thought, well, let's just see if he wants to put out a single. And my instinct was there's more, there's a lot of good songs here. Oh, like, thank you. We, we should, maybe this is more than that. And I think it led to, um, True love. Well, let's go see a show, you know? <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, you guys I, came to Nashville almost three years, right? Is that accurate? Well, it was July. I know it was okay, July okay. because I know how hot it was. <laughs> and I also know that it coincided that night with the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Yes, it did. Um, and how <laughs> do I know that? Well, we'll circle back around to that. But I just... <laughs> We, we came down there in July, which I guess would be July of 2018. Yeah, it would have been 18. I think you were doing, you set up a little house show maybe at Joey's house? Yep, at, at Leland, which is still a place that we constantly are doing creative stuff at. Joey still lives there. Uh, Sammy had just moved in there. It's like the hub for sure. But I think we so had like a quick, quick, quick something in the afternoon of the show and I had to dash off and maybe meet somebody else, maybe a Dia or somebody else down there. Yeah, we got pizza and, and then you went to see a We Dia. got pizza and, you know, it was remarkable to me in the days and weeks that followed because that night was a clearly a very special night. Mm. Sparks were just visibly flying around that yeah, man. room and oh, I could barely see you. <laughs> performing you just you when there's electricity you just know it totally. you know i guess if you do it for a long enough period of time the room really does become this animate object this animate beast that you just feel the chemistry between the performance and the people in the room yeah. and despite the fact that i would have probably fainted if i <laughs> stayed inside that house another another five minutes yeah you know i i it was a validator for my own instincts of having listened to those songs that Chris had played me. And, um, I needed some air conditioning. Yeah. I really just needed to go back to my <laughs> hotel and get some air conditioning. And I turned the TV on and it was the All-Star game. That's how I remember it was the All-Star game. It was my thirst for air conditioning. <laughs> it was a survival. But I just, you know, there was no manager then. There was no agent then. There was no lawyer then. There was no, it was just you. Yep. And whatever kind of sixth sense intuitive instinct that you had to put some trust in, you know, me and this young A&R kid that was kind of saying, you know, check this kid, check, check out Briston. So what was it about, what allowed you to have that kind of, faith in a situation seemingly um you know and and which then kind of led to like all the team building that we did which we should talk about too but absolutely how, how did you have such trust so early man well thank you first off for saying all of that that's really awesome to hear from your perspective that story all the time and my favorite detail about that story is seeing your head like five <laughs> inches above all these other people's heads because you were standing on the couch in the back of the room. In the far back of the yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget yeah. it, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. So honestly, I like it's going to sound like a maybe like a very like heady answer, but that that was enough for me, man. Just the fact that you guys came to that show by choice and there 
I'd had great experiences in Nashville up to that point with, with people who worked in music and just like people in the, in the scene. But there was, there was always a, a point where I felt a little bit disconnected from them, no matter how close we started to get. Um, and when picture, you know, he was so warm and so kind from the jump. Um, I mean, you, you know how Chris is. And so to go, you know, to, to go from meeting him and feeling that, that warmth and that kindness. And then to see you guys at the show, it, it was like a step that a lot of people I'd met weren't, hadn't done and just like weren't comfortable doing. Like, I don't know that many people that by choice would take, you know, fly in from New York and, and go into this ridiculous environment that, like you said, yeah, was ventilation. So, uh, <laughs> so the <laughs> fact that you guys were there and we, you know, everyone's equal in a room like that, which is part yes. of why I, I fucking love doing what we get to do. So yeah, I mean, the fact that you guys were there, it didn't matter where you or I had come from. You guys were there and as excited as everyone else. Um, and as, as, as excited as I was. So I, I just had yet to experience that sort of connection before. So seeing you guys there made me believe that you could work with people that were as excited about art as mm -hmm. you were and yeah man i mean that's that's proved to be the case i still feel like that energy is there when we all get to work together i think there were excuse the phone in the background it will stop eventually <laughs> no um i have no control over it um <laughs> i think there were some quick reference points that we hit on over pizza too maybe yep. just a quick a quick take on musical reference points, things in common yeah. or um, things in each of our history or favorite records. Or it was like a lightning round of some of that stuff. Oh yeah. Um, Just spilled it out. I mean, you, you at, also, you, well, your you know, roster is like my, you know, my, my playlist that I would listen to while I longboarded around when I would go visit my mom in the summer, <laughs> you know? So like, but that was, but you figured that playlist out at a pretty early age of life because a lot of those references were, I mean, some of them were pretty vintage and some of them were, you know, early 2000s when you would have been pretty young yeah. to figure them out. Maybe not the first time they came out, but like a lot of those things that we talked about were records that preceded your birth and then, <laughs> or even your teenage years. So you know, how is it, how did you in, in an age of, you know, um, in the age that you kind of, you know, grew up in discover your way to those things that became your touchstones and even back to like the John Prines and yeah. some of the vintage stuff that we shared, but all the way to like the Manchester orchestras and mm -hmm. some of the, some of those other things that we talked about, you know, yeah, how did, how did you find your way to those vintage things? Mm, wonderful question. I did want to tell you too, before I answer that, uh, I got to interview Andy in Atlanta. Uh, Great. and I, I talked to him about how the first time you and I met a major point where I was like, one of the first times, uh, that I was like, I got to play it cooler than I've ever played it right now is when you were like, yeah, you know, someday I hope to get you in a room with, with Andy. That'd be great. And I remember like choking <laughs> on my piece of pizza right there and just being like, <clears throat> ah, that's, uh, you know, if, if I've got, yeah, like, <laughs> um, but well, yeah, man, I, I don't know if I really have an explanation or, or any memory of how I stumbled into a lot of that music. I mean, I, I, my earliest experiences with just like discovering music were a lot of the CDs my dad had around the house. And so I was listening to a lot of, you know, more accessible, older stuff. I was like the first CD I ever pulled off of his collection was the white album um that like blew my mind and so i'm listening to all these classic bands and then i got to high school and um kind of immediately was drawn to hanging out with kind of the like delinquent kids who were also into the classic rock and stuff and then within that group there were who were like listening to even more obscure stuff um than that classic rock and they they kind of turned me on to like a lot of those early 2000s like that they were the guys who showed me queller and showed me uh mm -hmm. like matthew sweet and my mm -hmm. morning jackets mm -hmm. they got me into that world and then from there it's like an infinite infinite like you know 
uh, I don't even know the word. Like it's it's it, it the expanse of where that goes once you find. Once I found Queller, I wanted to. Queller was into, and then once I found those bands, mm-hmm. I realized they influenced Andy. You know, so yeah, yeah, man, it was just it's crazy how intertwined that world is. And Andy and I talked about that too. Like, you know, the influences that you share, like um, amongst and amongst people who you create similar art to or similar sentiments to like we're all gonna love towns bands in you know what i mean we're all gonna yeah. love those like those pinnacle artists so yeah I, I think it's cool to see to to meet you and to know that a lot of these people you'd worked with were occupying this really small space as far as like the connection between all artists um blowing you know well i think it's a great um it's kind of like an icebreaker if you know that someone you know, you don't have to go into a whole lot of detail yeah if you know the other person shares the same passions or passions for the same um you know creativity or songwriting totally. you know you just that's just a shortcut to like okay we think we, we we're going to get along just fine because we think alike because we like a lot of the same stuff or right. you know you mentioned you know ben, you know some of those people you mentioned i had been lucky enough to work with early in their careers matthew from the beginning and you know ben on the first solo record and you know you talk about those things and you know it's like okay well this guy relates to music maybe the same way i relate to music and you know, maybe there's, that's a good foundation for us to talk about working together. But I mean, the faith continued, the trust continued because it was the kind of thing where we then got into like, all right, let's, let's try to, let's figure out a way to work together. Um, let's put our heads together and think about how we're going to build a team, exactly. you know, cause that was the next, a big chunk of the next time was yep. who's gonna represent, who's going to be the booking, who's going to do the management, you know, and yep. That took a lot of faith um, as well. If you remember, you know, those days of how we kind of, not just on the music side, but on the on the team building side and on the business side, right down to the accountant. And I mean, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. If you remember, you know, that part of the whole journey too. Yes, I've tried to forget some of the more um, horrific mental states I was in during those times. <laughs> but, but the process <laughs> itself was, yeah, man, there's nothing like that. Like when I, you know, if I meet younger now that are like starting to that process that I was lucky enough to, to go through, I, I get so pumped for them because how I just, just so formative to like watch your like team assemble, um, the people that you want to share your art with assemble because everyone, I feel like you and I get to work with they just give a shit, man. I, it's like, it really comes down to that in my mind. And like, I know that's not a super articulate way to say it, but like truly at the end of the day to work with a lot of people who just care. And at the time, you know, um, it, it's crazy to think how unjustly angsty I was in that, in those early days and how, um, how like diehard getting to work with people who, we're just like bleeding music all the time. And like, you know, I've learned to like take a walk and drink a glass of water now in those moments where I'm like feeling so passionate about it. But uh, I need to get surrounded immediately through you and Chris with people who, who equally cared about music and had could at least relate, even if they had grown and matured from that period of time could relate to a time where, literally their food and water and shelter like you know so i i love the people that we get to work with now i do yeah well listen you know you project a kindness and a humility and a sincerity and also a determination and an ambition and an aspiration and it's a you know it's a tribute to the characteristics that you put out into the world i mean the music and the songwriting at your age (laughs) was speaking loud and clear but also there's a genuine spirit about you that's wiser behind your chronological years that I think a lot of people picked up on, Mm, you know, and, uh, and, you know, we, you know, we tried to kind of, whether it came to you came to us or we kind of steered it to people that we thought, you know, 
maybe we should put it to this one or put it to that one in, in this particular role or position, you know, that, that, that they have, sure. because we think they're going to maybe relate to it more. But I always talk to people about, listen, there's such an, you know, built in suspicion, disdain, mistrust, you know, over decades of legitimately um, borne out stories mm. of how the label is the necessary evil yeah. and, you know, they're good for this, but, you know, don't tell me how to do that. And, <laughs> you know, this was a case of, you know, you at 20 going on 21, trusting your instincts with people to guide you to the people that would inform lots of other important roles in your career. Sure. And that's not something that happens, you know, all the time. And, you know, you know, I, I, I'm always reminded w with young people, you know, Chris and I say this all the time. It's like the Briston, look, look at how the Briston story unfolded. Look at oh, amount, wow. look at the amount of trust and faith that went into all of that team building and all of that encouragement. And he was writing and recording music the whole time yeah. that we were building this. Well, what I think is a first class, world class team. Mm. You know, um, and he was just taking it in stride with confidence. So, you know, Thank a lot you, of this man. is down to you, to your faith. It really is. That's the, um, that's very, you know, very high praise. That's a very, it's not, it's not the case all the time. People sure. are like, Ooh, you know, yeah. my manager shouldn't, you know, my lawyer, my, my record company shouldn't be recommending a lawyer. Like they mm -hmm. should be enemies. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, there so, was, and there was, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate you saying that, man. And there was yeah. a lot of, um, a lot of learning at a really, really heightened pace at that time. And, you know, really thankful for, it. um, and I know you guys have, I think you guys have interacted a time or two, but I really got to thank my pops on that one. He, you know, mm -hmm. he, um, he grew up playing music and loving music and had some brushes with, with the industry for a bit. And, you know, now he works in medicine and couldn't really be further away from the music industry in his job. But, he like instilled me with these values of like, you know, being cautious, but being a sponge, trying to mm -hmm. literally just like take in everything all at once and, and gave me confidence to develop my own opinions and develop my own, to feel confident asking questions. Cause like, you know, that, that was another big thing within this team that I am so thankful for and realize more and more every day how rare it is that I can ask you guys questions and not feel mm -hmm. like an idiot and like feel like I deserve, you know, to do that and, and that you guys are going to answer me like with respect how much I respect you. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's yeah, man, that's, that's a, a special, special thing. Um, what, what do you think? I do want to ask you a question. So what, mm -hmm. when your career in the industry started, um, and we were, talking about how far back to go earlier you don't have to like dive too deep if you don't want to but as as much as you'd like to share but what do you remember kind of early stages for you where you felt like you started to and the types of people you wanted to work with and understand the the values um that stood out to you like in your co-workers in the industry like what what in the early stages of, of your career, what were you looking for? Perfect, like industry environment or just like musical work environment. I think it probably almost has to go back to kind of college years. Cause I got lucky and the kids that were running the, you know, the various concerts and radio stations and stuff graduated and it was a vacuum and, you know, I was 19 years old and I just said, well, I'm, I'm going to try this. Yeah. And I had no experience, but I just sort of self-taught and figured out a way to book bands and put on shows and work at a radio station and started managing bands and writing reviews for campus papers and yeah. local city papers. And nobody told me that I couldn't, but you know, I was the kid with the radio under the pillow and the music magazines mm and just studying every liner note and looking at closely at every set of credits on every album I could get my hands on from the time I was real young. And I think the things that always gave me the giddy pleasure or the, the sort of like, you know, against all odds were the weirdos. I always just gravitated to the ones that, or was captivated by the ones that I thought had 
the oddest sensibilities or the strangest voices or kind of like anti-formula um you know those were always the people that appealed to me and you know fortunately in those college years it was a real golden age turning point for the new records and first records and new bands you know the mid to late 70s was a very very fertile time for a lot of landmark bands and records and it was a real seismic shift yeah and the well the, what the underground was in 1975 you know we're still enjoying you know the, the the but the birth of punk and those days you know that whole ethos that whole landscape that that expression that turn away from virtuosity um the artfulness of the um the kind of dishevelment of it was really exciting and i always liked the kind of weirdos and the pioneers and the people that created the stuff and drew a line to what became their mainstream mainstream uh, progeny so to speak so you know when i w- when i left college i got to be around well i tour managed the b52s which you know <laughs> in the post love shack take on the b52s that's one thing but when they first started it was the warhol crowd it was max's kansas city it was it was oddball art culture new york downtown um weird weirdo weirdo <laughs> culture um uh the guy the my first boss managed talking heads in the ramones so that was the crowd that i was around when i was your age yeah and i was tour managing and on the road with them so you know was that was that terrifying like did you feel you know what i think it was just like there's a job to do okay you know you have no there's nothing there's no fallback on any of this there's no like you know i can move back in with my parents there's no i can you know i've got money to live on it's like i i had no choice i i was going to pursue the passion i was going to do the music thing and i thought that managing bands maybe tour managing bands not so much promoting shows anymore, but I, that's what I wanted to do. I think was manage artists and represent artists because I knew that I wasn't a good enough songwriter myself, <laughs> that I knew, I knew enough about music and culture and history. And I had that burning passion that I wanted to be around interesting, artistic, creative people. Right. So this is my early twenties. I was, it's like, okay, how do you tour manage a band? Well, you just kind of make a list of things that you think you need to do. And if you do them, right and you learn from the wrong often enough you figure out how to do that and by the time i was 23 i'd been around the world two or three times and been around the the cool bands of their time Mm. and that helped further instill my attraction to you know you i watched talking heads go from a little four-piece band to that nine-piece band uh, you know on different stages around the world i watched the ramones go from this you know polarizing new york entity to a landmark uh, band i watched patty smith become you know become what she became and i the b52 so that's what i was all around but at 25 i thought well that you know i better get i better get like a more secure i better get a more secure manifestation of this and yeah. i thought law school was what i was going to do at 25 i thought like no i better get my shit together i'm getting old so you got yeah. off the road with b-52s and said let me let me when i was 23 i got off the road with them i started managing a couple of people i managed tom berlain who had had the seminal band television in new york right. and was signed to warner brothers at a solo career i managed an electro electro band called plastics from japan they were signed by chris blackwell the legendary founder of island records and i managed a band from new york called the necessaries who among their members included the legendary late great arthur russell oh wow and they were signed by seymour stein legendary (laughs) record man uh, owner of sire records so I had bands with Sire, Warner, and Island that I was managing, and I would go on the road part-time, but I was 23, 24 years old. Right. And by the time I was 24, I'm like, man, you better get your shit together. You better go. <laughs> you better, you better, you better, you're getting old. Wow. So I, Crazy. I, I would go to law school, get an entertainment law degree, and do, you know, like what our friend Richard does. Right. I would be... I would be a music attorney and that's how I would represent artists because managing was still a hand to mouth. Sure. 
economic proposition. And were you, um, you were just drawn I, to the security of the idea of. I thought the yeah. security at that age was a sensible thing to do. I could stay <laughs> representing artists, but surely doctors like lawyers like doctors made a good living. Right. So that's what I would do. And then out of the blue, as I was applying to law school, a friend of mine who worked at a record company said that there was a label, another label in New York that was looking for an a and person. Mm-hmm. And my experience with A&R people up to that point was not all that pleasant because the bands that I was either working with or bands that I was thinking of working with, you know, it's that constant rejection from a and people. Right. And you're always wondering like, what the hell do you know? Where did you get your training? Sure. Like, I, I, I think there's a lot of value to this. And I just thought that all these major label A and R guys were just a bunch of like fatuous no nothings. And I sure. thought, well, I don't, I don't ever want to go to work at a record company and be thought of as that, right. you know, I was still in the, I want to run my own shop, whether it's a manager or, or, or a lawyer. So, but this friend of mine talked me into having a meeting, the guy that I had the meeting with, I had a lot of shared again, back to like, fast track to connections by the records that you, and the, you know, the touchstone landmarks that you have in common, I decided to forego law school for a year. Mm. Um, and that was 38 years ago, I guess. Wow. Um, just give, a, give the A&R thing a chance. The first company I, I, I worked at, the first band I ever signed, if you want to know, I do. comes from, ten, came from Tennessee. They were called Jason and the Scorchers. They were actually called Jason and the Nashville Scorchers. Hey, and I know I, them. I loved them because they were doing punk me Tank Williams. And I thought, well, there, that's a cool, weird idea. One and their uh, songs on my, uh, on my iPod. In yeah, school. broken whiskey glass or something <laughs> like that. They, they were great. They were doing the Clash meets you know, Lefty Frizzell, that was what the, their, their thing was. That's awesome. And, um, but then, you know, it was another record company job and, you know, another record company job. And along the way, I mean, the things that when I look back or people ask me about my favorite career highlights, you know, when I signed Rick Rubin's label, Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin were operating out of a dorm room at NYU and they just put out a few singles, 12 inch singles on this label called Def Jam. Wow. And, um, you know, that was exciting times too. But again, sure. it's like, that was a very weird proposition to, to, to talk about doing at a, at a major label. So there's lots and lots of those stories, but back to the so, original question, like I've always been attracted to, you know, the underground and this, and this, and the sort of oddball. That's, that's such an interesting dichotomy to me that at 23 or 24, you have, seek security and to want to be mm-hmm. s- seek stability but you still were signing bands that w- were completely unique and and like dangerous in a lot of ways mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm. I, think, I, I just i think it's really interesting that even in the midst of wanting safety you were still drawn to i think there was things. a push pull yeah. you know there was like i was attracted to emotionally what I was attracted to, you know, cr- creatively, I was attracted emotionally, but there was this other part of my brain that thought like, how do you give yourself the most secure possibility mm. to, to do, to do that? And I thought, well, you can be a lawyer and represent weird people, but you still get paid like a lawyer. Like that yeah. was, it was convoluted 25 year, 24 year old logic, but yeah. you know, there were other people that were, were in my orbit that I saw, wow, he represents this band and yeah. wow, he represents, that artist and you know but he looks like he makes a pretty good living but that's you know i've always I, you suffer you suffer and you enjoy your choices you know and sure. if you get lucky enough times and work hard enough that the choices that you're the proudest of come good then that emboldens you to keep to keep going yeah you know too so were there i mean were there times in the midst of signing these pretty obscure and sometimes like not as easily understood bands were there times where you were like wow what you know like if i had pursued maybe more mainstream acts what if i had had taken safer choices like what what were your thoughts because i'm sure there were tough moments within all of that like what i I tell you 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 have to go hard on what really moves you right because if you go hard and what you think is going to work because it's it follows a fashion <laughs> y- your chances of success are no greater yeah. and 
you know, with all, with the with the historically high degree of failure in this, you know, endeavor, yeah. you might as well go down with the ship and really love the ship you're going down on. Yeah. Then try to kind of like intellectualize your way to something that's working. I mean, believe me, I've tried times in my career to like, well, this, you know, geez, I had n- none of my passion choices have worked for a while. I better try to get me one of those. Yeah. Every time I've done that, it's failed miserably. Mm. It just hasn't worked. However nice the people are. Really? So you just like knowing that, you, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to go down, you're going to go down more times than you're going to stay afloat. <laughs> so you might as well go down with something like years later, I can still pull out Joe Henry's first record and go, man, I'm proud of that. Six people bought that, you know, <laughs> and why did, why did David Gray's white ladder become a phenomenon when he made three really good albums before that? Sure. And why, and why did Dave, why did David Gray's white ladder become this phenomenon and Joe Henry's first record? which I think is just as good still, you know, yeah. partisan and all. Why did that sell six copies? But I'm mm. proud. I'm so proud, you know, wow. I'm so proud. So, I mean, yeah, man, that's a, a living testament to the importance of caring about what you do. I mean, that's, that's yeah. crazy. I, you know, I, I've heard so many people that I look up to my whole life are, are people that embody that attitude. And I hear myself sometimes say like, yeah, man, you know, I'm, I'm going to really stick to this idea. I'm pretty passionate about this. And if I'm fucked, I'm fucked, you know, and I say that out loud and pretty good, but on the inside, I'm freaking out and I'm, I'm, you know, having such a hard time truly embodying that. And Cause I mean, that's a leap of faith truly to, to place passion and to place a project that you really care about, you know you know it's multitudes of success you know and a lot of paddle boys so like listen there's no you can't go to the bookstore and buy a manual right. on how to drink the perfect plan you know i say to chris i say to jack and chris it's like what do we do we work hard to get lucky we choose yeah authenticity you know there's criteria you want an interesting voice you want somebody that can write a real story mm. you want somebody that can evoke real emotions you want somebody that brings traditional vintage musical values forward you want somebody that can excite a crowd in in performance i mean these lists i'm you know talking about my historical criterias you know it's yeah. like walk in the room and the room lights you up like that night at you know leland yeah you know those are the nights for me that convinced me, you know, and the next night in another town or the night before might have been like, you know, might be not so magic. That's so true. so there's timing and there's luck and there's good choices and there's hard work and you're going to quote unquote fail nine out of 10 times. Sure. So it's kind of a fool's errand if you're looking for security. <laughs> but if you're the kid that got swept away when they came of age to first experience deep emotional intelligence and creative passionate connection points right you know you, you if, if, if you're lucky enough to make to turn that into your living you know you just like listen i've gotten lucky a lot of times too nobody thought that def jam was going to become def jam nobody right nobody thought the beastie boys license to ill was going to become the landmark nobody <laughs> and i don't care if anybody tells you that they knew that it was nobody it's like this is cool it's fun they can't play it's sassy it's new york it's it's the, nobody thought it was going to become a cultural <laughs> landmark nobody sure you know mm. um so I don't know. I, I there's a lot of luck and timing that goes into all this too. I guess is sure. part of what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean that's that's beautiful, man. I guess in how I was doing a, a little podcast interview with somebody yesterday, and they were asking um, about you know obviously uh, you you know this, but uh, one song of my catalog is like substantially more streamed than like a like a comical amount of streams. It's amazing, but they were asking if I had started to feel a pressure to replicate that song based on the performance of that and the other, other music. And it, it was a great question. I found it really interesting down like the journey with that of being like, yeah, I, you know, for a while, I think I really was in that mindset of like even subconsciously trying to put myself in positions where I was going to write that song again or write a similar song to that. Um, literally, you know, over time I've kind of realized that like, like you said, it's a fool's errand to, to try to replicate this thing that's already mm-hmm. happening. You know, 
not to say that that same sentiment can't be stricken in a completely new way not to say that something could people again you know like i have a really positive outlook on it now but i i feel like the same thing would apply to you know i i'm sure in the a and r world walking into an electrifying room and then walking into nine after that that don't hit you this that's got to take maybe a mental toll on it like what mm-hmm. uh, what is the driving force i guess when you have had nine shows in a row or 20 shows in a row that aren't striking you like what at the end of the day i'm in a couple different ways already but it, maybe just like a, a mantra of like after you've seen like i said 20 shows in a row that don't like haven't quite given you that lightning strike how, what do you do to not let yourself be like well this is this is cool this band this is great like what do you do to hold out for those moments that really set you on fire especially i think sometimes sometimes the best yeses or nos you know mm. to kind of coin a silly cliche sure um i've always felt that you know the less you commit to the more time you have to work hard on developing it to its maximum potential sure um it's you know it's it's a it's a tougher road because you know there's there's philosophies that are like sign everything and you know who cares about the 98 that don't happen it's the two that stick Mm. and then my thing is like just wait for just wait just be patient don't say yes because you think it's got a chance to be commercially successful wait for that perfect combination and it doesn't come around listen sometimes it could come twice in the same day and sometimes you don't get it for two or three years but wait for what you believe that you can attach to that you feel passionate enough about that you're willing to go through the steeplechase you know gauntlet of of all the obstacles that are naturally going to come your way it's just you, you build in patience. And I think also it's helpful that, you know, you get two or three that have worked up to a certain point under your belt. It helps to bolster your confidence because this is a, this is an endeavor that requires tremendous confidence in the face of lots of adversity. So, yeah. you know, you learn patience. It's help. Your patience is helped by getting some maybe unforeseen levels of success but um, I always believe that it's a you know less is more because you have a better chance to really work deep more deeply on the things that you you know you, you've gotten into. And plus, I don't have the kind of emotional um, fortitude to just kiss off things that you know you tried for five minutes and they didn't work and we're moving on. Like sure. it's heartbreaking for me. Yeah to say goodbye to someone who's put their faith in my Mm. efforts and abilities to help their creative careers along too. So that, that's, 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 that's just, you know, that's just part of who I am. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not. A fantastic answer. Uh, I was gonna, that's funny that you, you mentioned that last little part because I was, I was going to ask like, you know, playing music, like that's my role in all this stuff. That is a place that I've found a lot of community and something that's, really beautiful about uh playing music obviously is that it kind of requires you to be connected um and i've found most of my closest friends through that and on on the other side of that coin like it's it's really hard to separate um my life from the music sometimes and i've experienced that the past year or two of like when i need to just be briston or when i need to be person who's getting to experience these incredible things and trying to understand everything all at once and so did you growing up feel like you were able to separate you know signing these bands and this passion for this this work (laughs) how much of that was like your breath like how much of what of that was your life like did you do you feel like you have to be able to separate it or do you think you're you're better off to let it be your entire life. You know what I mean? I don't know if that's a yeah. Cool question. I mean, it was immersive. I must say, you know, the friends that I had, the work that I did, the the shows that I went to. You know, it it was a much more unidirectional landscape too. You know, when I was your age and kind of coming into developing my career, it was music and bands and shows right. and movies. That was it. It wasn't all. This was long before 
all the options that we have to seek out information and entertainment that we take for granted today. I yeah. mean, you know, it was, um, you know, answering machines were new, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, you know, imagine tour managing without a cell phone oh, or the internet. Good God. You know, I go to pay you. phones and hope that the guy in the, at the club would answer the phone to say, what time can we load in tomorrow? Jesus Christ. You know, <laughs> so, but no, it was immersive. Uh, you know, it was what I adored and what I loved. And it was going to the record store and it was having those friends that were always somehow tuned in. Yeah just that little bit much before about what the best new bands were mm. and what the best new records were. You learn more from, you know, and you learn more from reading, you know, you learn yeah. from reading the music magazines, what was, what was going to get the blessing. So my friends, you know, I mean, it's not built for part of the reason why I wanted to get off the road full time was that I saw, you know, at that time it was horrifying to think about, you know, being 40 years old and being on the road. And I thought, well, these people are never going to have lives or wives or kids or families or, you know, downtime. Like that was just the worst, like, oh my God, you can't be a 40 year old person and be on the road. Right. Oh, that would just be the, the worst thing ever, you know? Sure. Um, but uh, no, it was immersive for me. It was, it was all the time. Yeah. Mm, that's awesome. I figured. <laughs> It's very, yeah. very hard for it not to be. Yeah. So as developed and grown through your career, have you found that you need it? Because I know I kind of wanted to talk about, I, I know that you, you are just like a fan of art in all forms. And I know passion for theater and visual art as well. Mm -hmm. So are those things for you, um, extensions of your relationship with music do you, or do you feel like you need these other passions to, to balance out your relationship with. Cause you know, in 2020, I obviously we were off the road. We'd just come off of, mm -hmm. of, of a period of time where I thought we were always going to be on the road and I had to completely kind of reestablish what I, I cared about. But what, what is your relationship with art outside of music? I mean, I, I think, you know, there maybe sort of shortly after, my early years of being infatuated with, um, you know, the progressive radio, FM radio late at night, it was music magazines, and it soon got into different writers, mm. soon got into different authors, soon got into different biographies, you know, all that Kerouac beat generation mm. in high school was a big source for me. So all that Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, the stories of their you know, emergence on the scene and their impact on popular culture. Right. Um, then it was, you know, hearing about these French existentialist writers and wanting to learn more about what that was. And mm. it was the, the Tom Wolfe's electric Kool-Aid acid test, which led me to the books and Kesey, yeah. you know, went over the cuckoo's nest and sometimes a great notion. So there was, there was this pantheon of American writers and novelists that I was attracted to as well. And then I think some of the kids that were, I was around in college, you know, that just happened to be lucky enough to be in living situations nearby that came from interesting creative visual art backgrounds. So I would learn about the art of Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns at a very early age. And I just always found something in visual expression and literary expression um, where I was always kind of keen to find out who the, who the underground, who the radicals, who were the chance takers, Same, similar passions as music. And I just thought it was a, an interesting and well-rounded way to be involved in the arts. And I probably had a couple of teachers in college who told me that there were playwrights that would fit the same bill, that yeah. there was a young playwright named Sam Shepard and I would read his plays and on breaks in New York, I would go see his early plays mm. and, live theater always captivated me because it was happening in front of you. It wasn't a movie at a movie theater. It right. was happening, performing in front of you. And that, that captivating experience of creative artistic expression has always been. So I also think it's the New Yorker in me too, mm. that, you know, that's the best part about living in New York. It's just the cultural playground that, yeah. you know, when it's open and humming and running at full tilt, it's, it's, it's the main reason to, 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 to be there that you can go to a gallery and go to a small indie film thing and go to a club and see a show and 
I always had this imagined romantic idealism about New York because I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, but when I would visit the city or go spend some time with my grandparents, it was just this incredible, like the, you know, the, the classic image of the black and white skyline yeah. at night or the jazz clubs or the downstairs basement clubs in the sixties or the folk scene or why all that iconic imagery of New York was really a magnet for me. And it wasn't just the magnet of the music. It was the magnet of all these other cultural Everything. forces that were constantly roiling yeah. around and in New York. So New York's always been this animated and animated character for me and yeah. all of that all of that culture that exists, you know, in the in in the history of New York was so Yeah. I just I don't know, I just creative expression, you know. So you were you were just running around when you were a kid yeah. in New York. You were just like stumbling yeah. into shit. What I yeah. mean, what was the the fe- like did you have any awareness of how crazy that was as I mean as a kid just getting to run around New York City? at the time like this is fucking gigantic like the world is. i think in my in my pre-high school years and my i finished high school in queens but i was that close yeah you know when i would visit grandparents i was it was it was in an outer borough it wasn't manhattan manhattan was the gold manhattan Mm. was the ultimate it was the it was the greatest city on earth and i was always just not able to quite get into Manhattan. Mm. I mean, there would be like, you know, you'd say to you, you know, whoever you were with, you say, well, we're just going to go up here and you'd sneak in, you take the, the, the E train or the N train into New York and you'd run around the village yeah. and you hope that you would get home in time. It was <laughs> all that sort of like high school, junior high school type stuff. Yeah. But because I think I was that close, but not in it, in it, in the city itself, it, it always said this, like when I'm old enough, when I'm, you know, when I can call my own shots, I am going to live in that city. And I am going to all day, every day, all night, every night, just soak it all up. The neighborhood, the bookstores, the nightclubs, the movie theaters, the restaurants. Like Kelly, yeah. for whatever reason, it just had either through film or TV or the fact that I was that close to it, but couldn't really enjoy it as a teenager mm. that had led to this pent up, this, this pent up desire. Yeah. New York, New York just became this character. God, you know that's so cool, man. Yeah, I mean that's so full circle though because that's what I I loved about uh, where music would take me living in kind of a small southern. T- having those options, I you know those records became what New York was for you at that age. Was there was there a time when you were kind of in your mid teens or something, and you were really kind of starting to do it and write songs and create things and having the early phases of confidence that this was something that could actually be something measurable was there ever like a i gotta go to los angeles or i gotta go to nashville or i gotta go to new york was there ever a destination city geography that became this larger than life kind of part of the ambition i think it it, it, it's funny you ask that i think i never i never had the dream of packing the bag and walking into the airport with a guitar case like you know one new york city please like i never mm-hmm. had this idea around that with with music being the pr- propelling force when i was a kid like i don't know how my parents put up with this shit like they were probably so f- just constantly worried but like i love being like a Kerouac character that like when you know you realize later on those people are like <laughs> maybe not like stand up individuals <laughs> like they're not doing a whole lot for the <laughs> for the yeah. community there yeah. but I definitely was obsessed with like the idea of just being alone in any city and being alone in any situation like I, I love the idea of just travel so it, yeah music was ne- I never thought like I'm gonna go to the city and music I belong here I always wanted to just get out of of Knoxville really and just be somewhere and not really care if I made it or not. So like I had a pretty, just like, I was always really open to the idea of just like drifting, which was like <laughs> at the time and so silly. I actually ran away um, from school one time uh, with, I had a couple of my friends give me their calculators and I put them all in my backpack and I was going to sell them. Um, so I'd have some extra dough and I was going to go live in downtown Knoxville. Um, 
some deadheads down there that were really nice mm-hmm. to me, which was crazy. Mm-hmm. They were like in their thirties and I was like 14. And, um, how long did that, how long did that little, well, the, little excursion take? the school was at the top of a hill. And so I snuck out after lunch. Um, and I got, which, and I could see the interstate where I was going to go, um, go th- thumb my way downtown. And then, um, I started crying and I walked back up to the top. And when I got there, uh, the teachers were all waiting outside and then, um, a bunch of officers and a fire truck came pulling up behind me because they had thought I had been kidnapped and it was (laughs) pretty funny. If if you look back at songs that you were writing then or a little bit after then and you listen to them today, is it cringy? Is it there was something there? Or I, like, when's I, the last time you went back that far and listened to something that you wrote back then? It's been a while, but I don't think, like, and I'm not just saying this, like, I really don't think there's a ton of difference, like, mm-hmm. in the sentiment of a lot of the songs. I think it, I was faking it a little bit more because, like, I just hadn't been through a lot of the shit that I've been through now. Mm-hmm. But I was still, you know, I was obsessed with Elliot Smith and Nick Drake was like my hero. Like I got, mm-hmm. I got in trouble for writing a paper about Nick Drake, my like eighth grade thesis. I, I want, I wrote about like how his struggle with depression and everyone at mm-hmm. school was very concerned. And so like, I, you know, I, I was, so was that because they thought it was, you were projecting or the, or personalizing or internalizing yeah, they, his story to yourself? Well, or? yeah, I think I found solace in that. I think I, I did mm-hmm. feel some, you know, I was a pretty melancholy kid. Mm-hmm. There was a lot going mm-hmm. on. And so, yeah, I definitely really connected with that stuff, but I, it, it was a scary thing because I, I, w- I didn't have the tools to communicate and I, I was just, I was just always going to be sad. So, um, yeah, I really connected to that stuff and so those early songs were me just kind of just like regurgitating because none of my friends were going to call me out for being like hey man that's literally just a nirvana song do that right. so yeah as as i've gotten older i've realized that i i want to have a little bit more of my own voice but yeah at the time i would love man i'll have to find my very first little record that i made and send it to you some really I, okay, they're maybe a little bit cringy, but there's some some classic tracks on there. Um, I'm trying to think of some of them. So you said something a, a few minutes ago about this kind of patterning after what works, you know. Um, yeah. With freaking out on the interstate, uh, you know, being a signature song and so forth, and all, with all the random accidents that happen and the different outlets and ways that people find music and share music and celebrate music. And, right. you know, certainly, you know, um, there are any number of other songs of yours that have gotten great accolade, attention, support, Absolutely. sharing, etc. as we kind of go into this great time of, you um, your album coming out um we just the growth has been fantastic and you know of course you know we all think it's the model plan and we've all done this genius work and (laughs) you know so forth and so on and it's like the model of development and what great shape we're in and all that's true yes but um uh, i'm just curious because i i i don't think that I do think it's a fool's errand to try to rewrite the same song that got, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like yeah. that to me is a doorway into discovering the rest of the body of work yeah. and, you know, we're all delighted, but do you ever kind of feel like, do you ever worry that people are just going to kind of go, well, that's, you know, like this person equals the, oh, he's the so-and-so because mm. we live in such a fungible ADD culture where people are so quick to genre eyes or identify with, or like they need to put something in a box so that they understand it yeah. so they can move on to the next box and the next box and the next box. Does it, does it bug you? Do you celebrate sure. it? Do you think about it at all? You know, that's a excellent question and a, also a great circle back because the same way that you were describing a lot with your draw to the outsider you know Mm -hmm. jagged bands and people that were just like not very far left of center and so i to me the out is the song that seems to have connected with the most people it like makes me laugh not in like a cynical way but it's like it's it's amazing that this song 
is getting to exist, you know, I'd, because thing, the whole thing, which we should do an episode specifically dedicated to talking about what the fuck TikTok is, uh, mm. which I think I'm supposed to like know what it is by now. Like, I think it's, it's no longer like funny for me to be like, you know, what the fuck is, t- mm. I think I feel that a little bit, but, um, you know, the fact that that song is getting to exist amongst other songs, like, you know, the fact that that song is, is there and getting to be there gives hope that like there are kids in the midst of this really fast paced internet generation that like still need maybe something that I could offer. And like, I, I don't expect every song obviously to, to connect scale with everybody. That'd be so foolish. And that would be probably the wrong reason to be doing what I get to do. But like, yeah, man, I, I have hope that there will always be a pocket of people. And this is just like learning from watching the bands that I, people I love that make music. Like there's always, um, there's always somebody that's going to connect what you do if you're doing it from your heart. And, and that success of that song, it really just pumps me up that like, okay, like if we hit that mark again, that's obviously what we want to shoot for. But you know, the, the number of people that, may go from that song to the the rest of the body of work or this, you know, the record that's coming out. Like, yeah, that's amazing because like this, that song kind of defied a couple odds and even is getting to exist at the level it is right now. So anyone that, that needed that, um, like I'm, I'm making music for them and I'm making music for, for anyone who wants to hear it. But like specifically, you know, I, I'm coming to terms with what I can offer songwriter and as a person to stay, genuine you know like what my limit is of what i'm able to to give and still maintain like sincerity so like if people want that then like i i would be honored to all day you know what i mean and so yeah i mean that's why i'm stoked about this record which is a a great segue into talking about that i mean yeah kind of the whole point of the podcast was just to kind of talk about yeah have conversations with everybody and kind of introduce characters who, yep. who help but i yeah i wanted to ask you what were what were your what were some of your early memories of me bringing in like and demos and like what you know where how, well, how did i this... mean this is the thing i mean sometimes you sign people and like then you hold your breath because like the <laughs> second round of you sing, oh, you sign you're happy right they got these great songs we're gonna make a record right. the show was great and then like here comes the first batch of new songs since you get signed you go uh oh <laughs> ooh the best is not yet to come oh, the boy. best is already ha- oh now what do we do <laughs> oh we'll take our time there'll be more don't worry don't worry that first batch, I think Chattanooga was on it mm-hmm. and, and some of the other songs that were on, there was like a whole batch of songs. I'm like, Chris, this is great. Not <laughs> Thanks, only does man. it validate the bet, but it accelerates the proposition because like there's a prolificness to this, you know, there, there's a constant quality to this. Oh, it's like, man. I just remember walking down the street in my neighborhood in New York with the earbuds on listening to these songs. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, it wasn't just a magical night uh-huh. in East Nashville in July. So you were- it was, this is like, this is a great batch of songs. Wow. But then again, you had the interest and appetite to explore collaboration because it's never mm. been, I'm attracted to auteurs. I'm attracted to people that write their own life story that can sing it and perform it in a very compelling way. That's just part of my criteria. Sure. I'm not the guy that somebody goes i'm a singer go find these songs i wouldn't know how to do that if you put a gun to my head plenty of people do that that's why they maybe a and r is a term that comes artists or repertoire like there's a singer and then there's songwriter right. i don't like i sign people that write their own stories and sing them and play them well that's what i like to do mm. so you know you say well i wouldn't mind trying to collaborate you know i think both of us were interested in congleton or around the same time like that might be based on records that he's done like the perfect kind of fit and then i remember the conversations that i had with the manager and let's do this developmentally and let's do some sessions and take some time and maybe write with him and then he's got people for you to write with and i had some couple people couple people that you know not to sound like i'm contradicting myself but you know andy hall and dan wilson and daniel tashin yep those were all artists that I, those are all people that I had signed in my career as artists in their bands who also happen to be really good songwriters. Well, maybe 
see what those are. But you, you know, curious to get a take from you that you at that point were interested in the collaborative process, not just with John right. in exploring the relationship that would go into the full on production, but like wanting to put yourself into those situations because you really hadn't done like a whole, you weren't like, no. you know, old hat at doing that. So no. that was like a first big part of it. It was identifying Congleton. Then it was doing these collaborations before we even got to who's playing on this record. <laughs> yeah. Um, the band, the live bands part of playing on the record, the different stages of the record, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth and so on the chapters that happened after that with which songs and mixes and all that stuff. But like, the collaborative part of it, I always like to tell the story. It's like Briston wanted to do it. And what we didn't, you know, because all day, all day long, these A&R departments, A, they sign on research and B, they're putting people in with songwriters, right. you know, which I don't know. I, I guess, it, I mean, that's, that's part of how the game is, but you wanted to pursue that. So can you give us a take, give me a take on, on why that was a, was a, was an in, 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 of interest at that time going, because you had a bunch of great songs already. Oh, it thanks, wasn't like man. you needed it. Thank you. I, this is, I'm so stoked to be answering this question, um, with you very honestly, I, to be, to be real, I was fucking terrified that this, <laughs> so, <laughs> so a huge part of it was me. I could totally bring it to you guys to, and be like, yeah, man, I just want to expand my palette a bit. But in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, well, <laughs> if I can't do it, maybe, <laughs> maybe Dan Wilson can help me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean i genuinely it started from a place of of insecurity and just like fear um that i wasn't gonna be able to to do that alone and i learned that a little bit of both sides being true i think that i learned that i'm totally i i am capable like i hope that doesn't sound cocky but i i feel like i have i've learned enough to be able to tell my own story also learned that I am not always right and that there are parts of the story that might be more important than parts that I fixate on so yeah I mean going into right with those people I more more so than anything it was like I all of those processes felt like a ton of of words and a ton of ideas and a ton of just like anxiety and these people being like here's what you need the rest of it like you should maybe talk to a therapist about and then we'll go from there so like it, it was a real that was part of working with john too is it was a lot of just like simplifying um and so those those people really ended up helping and i don't even think they they know the impact of what they did um but like me to breathe and simplify a lot of those ideas because like mm -hmm. Man, yeah, I I remember being so scared when I sent you and Chris that first batch of songs, and you you called me from a cab in New York, and I was like, "This guy <laughs> is in New York City, the big fucking Apple, and he's listening to my little demos, and I'm losing my shit in my little bedroom right now." Like, yeah, it was crazy, man. So I, you know, I had never, I started I started singing because songs and and wanted to share the songs and so like songs are a really delicate thing to me and i i it's always been really personal and and really like essential for me to be happy so to to then start with other people and and realizing like they had weight and it, i i wanted people to like them and i wanted them to to be meaningful to the people i was working with like it was a crazy process of of figuring out how to balance other people in mind and yeah, and some sessions are going to be more comfortable from the get than others. Right. And some people are going to be weirder than others. Yeah. And, you know, getting that, getting that first kind of kickstart into an idea for a song. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, it's gotta be, you know, it's like a blind date Yeah, and you're doing a whole bunch of blind dates. Yeah. I definitely learned I can't go in without an idea like, just for the sake of like, and, and, you know, when I went and saw Andy, I hadn't seen Andy in a year or something. Mm -hmm. And I uh, gave him a hug. He said, welcome home. And I quote, and then literally was like, welcome home. So yeah, this is the second verse. And you know, right now we're thinking, <laughs> and I was like, thank God that we're doing this. Cause like, if I had to shoot the shit, I would have been so nervous. 
music for two hours and then it was like everyone was breathing and we were like we're all here to make fucking awesome music when you started to take some of those collaborations and your own songs into the beginnings of this record um what were some of the first surprises um that you didn't see coming as as intuitive as you are Mm. what were some of the things about the actual making of the record when it got started that were that that maybe came as a surprise that you didn't see coming um thank you for saying that um I I wasn't familiar with with Ginny Owens Young. I I hadn't heard any of her music before. So I went into that thinking like, oh, this will go one way or another. And like I'll have a buddy. And then we ended up writing one of my favorite songs on the record. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, one of like yeah. the sweetest, most like yeah. sincere songs on the record. So that was awesome. I didn't I didn't know that John and I were going to get to write so much he's so collaborative so that was fucking awesome because the first one of the first sessions we met up to do for the record john was like literally play me anything you have right now like i don't care if you have words i don't care if it's two chords like play me something and that was still cool if you don't that was it's still cool yeah yeah <laughs> which yeah insane man um so yeah those were both really surprising in an awesome way um the andy working with andy all i do now is talk about andy like I think all the close people in my life um, are getting pretty sick of it because all I do. But um, yeah, that was that was like I I knew I was really hopeful that we would do something really specific because like he has such a distinct style and like I love that about him and I'm just such a fan of his. I knew a lot of like the tendency songwriting wise and I really connected with a lot of that, but that was a process of coming in without an idea like I didn't have anything um and he played me some chords on a guitar and then that was the first one that was like from complete from you know literally just like played some chords one way and I was like what if we did it this way and then Rob's you know it's sitting there with the guitar and he's like well what if this was the guitar part and then it was just like that fast it was it was really rapid so that was really fucking cool too was like a dream like that felt like I was in a yoga class the whole time <laughs> like it was just so meditative and just so laid back um all i mean i guess to to answer honestly like it's all surprising just at the the idea of it being an experience i survived like you know i didn't expect that to be something that i um really would end up finding so much comfort and joy in it was i was really scared to make this record so yeah, I mean the fact that in the we, recordings of those collaborations, um, did you keep people posted? Did you intentionally keep that at a distance? Did you did you not want to um, you know potentially suffer any I don't know frustration on your collaborators' parts about yeah. how the song came out, or did you not even think about that? Um, it didn't cross my mind a lot. But I yeah. definitely, as we started to get versions of the songs, I definitely was like, I want to make sure these are great before I get to send them out to these people that mm-hmm. like I wanted to, to sound fully developed. And so everyone was so, you know, so sweet about it once we started sending stuff out. And I mean, that's like the nicest group of people in the world, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a huge, this record seems to be the way that it was. And I mean, your, your contributions included and Chris's contributions included. I mean, it's all people who really, really love music. Like, did you, I wanted to ask you. So, like, when we met, I mean, I came in obviously. Your songs, like, how, like, did you expect how how when you heard the final mix of the record the first time you listened song, mm-hmm. you know, track one to track ten, like, how did it compare feeling wise to that first night that we met? Like, did you was it a record that you were like, this makes sense coming from? seeing this show in the sweaty living room or like was it a whole different experience like what what is that like like not just specifically me but see Mm -hmm. a band make a record like it's a very it's a very good question because it's hard to take yourself out of that first impression because you kind of have mental frame of what it is that you see in it or how you describe it or how it describes itself to you but you know that logically the recording of that is going to add 
it, instrumentation, arrangement, sonics, it's going to add depth and dimension to it. And it's sort of going from like the live version of whatever demo itis would be. And, like, okay, and then you have the demo version and you fall in love with the demos. And then they got all this other stuff that wasn't on the demo. So it, it's a period of constant adjustment that you have to kind of mentally ahead of time, allow yourself to be open open for i think part of what drew us to john was the work that he had done with any number of other people so we knew that it was going to add colors and add layers and add textures and so forth right but i think like the earlier the earlier in the making of had a rawness to it that in many ways was more like the show mm. But there was this push pull thing that I felt like maybe there should be more colors. And you guys are probably still in the evolution of, a, you know, filling out some of these arrangements. But my first take was like, this might be a little bit too stripped back. Sure. We might need a little bit more weirdnesses going on in the arrangements here. Right. And of course, eventually it got to all that. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't one through 10 because if you remember, there's, you know, there were yeah. more than 10 songs. Yeah that we had conversations about and we had conversations about, you know, maybe did we go too far with adding too much and did some of the stuff need to get stripped out? Yeah. And, you know, did some of these, you know, some of the vocals were better drier and some of them were better layered. Sure. And, um, but I think there's an ambition and it's also evident in the visual work that you've done with Joey as a mm. companion piece to this record, yep. that there's an artistic reach and ambition that far exceeded, I think, what my initial takeaway for where I saw your music and art going, that it's really extraordinary. Wow. Thanks, man. The ambition and reach that you've had, and you've realized it in the arrangements and sonics. Yep. And granted, you know, there were many conversations that we had, that we had with John, that I had with you, that I had with John about, you know, trying to keep an authenticity yeah. at the base of all this while supporting the, the sonic and producing ambition yep. of the sound of the record at the same time, that dichotomy. But then you and Joey made this whole other atmosphere around this record. You guys made this visual interpretation of it, yeah. which to me, there's no way that I could have seen that at that house in Leland in July we couldn't of either. 2018. Well, there's no way. Joey, I saw sparks flying around the room. I saw kids loving. I saw your authenticity. I saw your, 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 your natural kind of like grace and charm and commitment to it but there's no way that any of us could have seen that you had the depth of um ambition either to make a record that fully realized mm. or the films that you guys have made that i think of our, I, I, of it as a, a one and like a companion yeah to the whole to the whole experience wow. so thank you man i mean that's that's fucking super high praise i mean i felt yeah, I frankly I feel the same way. <laughs> I never, never, ever would have guessed more so that I, we would have gotten an opportunity to do that, like an opportunity to let freely. And I, I really do think, and I'm, I'm totally okay with this, like that the record would not be what it was without the the visual, explorative side, and I uh, literally down to the album art. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> we did an episode with Hudson who shot the album art and it's two and a half hours of complete bullshit. There's no, <laughs> nothing fucking happens at all. We literally like pee on a bonfire at one point. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's some wise points though, but, uh, yeah. But I, listen, like, you brought Joey to the party too. Joey was at the party to begin that with. That was Joey's like, house. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But the thing is that, you know, you guys that did a couple of like you make a couple of videos like wow this is really good and <clears throat> it's Thank resource you. savvy it's cost effective mm -hmm. and at one point the, the 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 royal we of all this said let's make video let's do let's one do for it. every song yeah and let's maybe then which we're in the middle of now let's make a movie out of all this stuff yeah, baby. and let's make it a, a you know the album is the movie and the movie is the album and yep. whatever you want to call it but like that that's another thing that you and your cohort brought to this mm. without any encouragement. You had that 
as part of your collective, as part of your world. Sure. And you know, it's just well, that's you, it's, can't, you can't think of too many debut records by somebody of your age mm. that had the wherewithal, resourcefulness, and inspiration to pull all that off. Well, thanks, man. Comes down to it, and why I'm so excited that we've gotten to talk about some of your relationships with with music early on in your career. Like I, I think we just I I relate to that so much, man. Like it's just it's a we've got to to do this, and like it's you know we've made the sacrifices and made the life choices so that it it can be our fully immersive. Like it's it's there have been times with the record that it felt like work, um, and it felt difficult on maybe just like an exhaustion level and like a mental exhaustion level, but like. For the most part, like particularly working with Joey, we are we are playing like little kids, man. Like we are just having f- so much fun, even you know, really vulnerable and like sensitive things visually. Like it's just, it's just fun, and I think that that's how was it when you when you brought the guys in because you know a lot of the record got, had gotten going, and then there was touring stuff, and then yeah. the band was really kind of you know getting getting super you know tight and stuff sure. and you've done a lot of shows under the belt and i mean how was it with those guys coming into something that was already kind of underway sure it was a little bit of a turn in the road for how the process was going to go yeah. if you remember that oh, oh yeah i i remember it all man it, <laughs> uh, it keeps me up at night sometimes just kidding <laughs> <laughs> but uh th- i mean that was awesome i i needed them there and uh, like looking back on it for their time um yeah i mean we had most of the people that played on the record were were john's old buddies and um Mm -hmm. all amazing players amazing dudes but it's it's a tough environment to really get to know people quickly um if they're you know and on some songs that you just wrote for two days and then you probably won't see these people again for a while if you know if ever if, if, if you get lucky i would love to see those guys again but i knew that's a really delicate thing so to have have the boys have jack and noah come out um it's like such a breath for me to be like okay we have 10 days out here in la with my two best friends like what that allowed me to do was crack the jokes that we would crack like we were in the garage together country accents and like i think it allowed john to see a side of me that was like a lot goofier and just like a, you know the like the teenage boy that comes out of me when I'm around those two little knuckleheads so um the whole window of John realizing a bit more of my personality and I think from there we were able to like make some choices on the record that lean or that were like encapsulated more like who I am which was like a really big turn like yeah I don't think cohesively like I definitely think it all blends together really nicely but personally like listening to the songs that the guys that I play with at home played on versus some of these people that I had just met like there is there's a different tinge of elements are are different and I think the two are essential to make the record work but like yeah that was I mean that was great like just doing anything with your friends is fucking awesome and I'm so lucky dude I have the greatest friends in the world they're amazing people and they love and they're weird and funny and so spe- speaking of friends you know part of the story when we first met was this sort of group of this collection of people in a certain part of nashville east nashville and yeah. a lot of other artists and writers and musicians um i mean obviously the conditions of the last year or so um r- you know have a have a play a real role and have a real impact on how those relationships can maintain their social ability and so forth um but even you know even when you were able to tour you were away from that you, you look back on that as a kind of a fiber a fibrous element to your confidence and evolution as an artist that community of people oh yeah now two or three years on and how does it describe itself to you and how have you maintained after this experience of making a record touring not touring etc with with that community does it naturally just take its turn like life does or is there is there something that's innate to how you keep together with with that world because i know it's always been such an important part of who you who you totally. are 
you know, and where you are. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've talked about even doing a whole podcast segment, just going through an interview. Yeah these bands from Nashville and these artists from Nashville that that kept me going and have inspired me to this day I mean it's it's definitely such an active part of my life still like this scene and just you know the way that we look out for each other in in quiet ways um like you know there there are artists here that inspire the hell out of me that I haven't talked to in two or three years um but I know that if I saw them we'd pick up where we left off because it's just it's how it is here so yeah I mean that that is such a thing I mean Nashville like you know, um, same move here uh, in the past few months, and like I, it's been so awesome to see her enter this scene, and kind of just like even in the midst of not being able to see anyone, still <clears> feel <throat> that community. And like we had some friends in from New York um, that, and like they talked about how immediately just coming into the city, how nice people are here, man. It's it's a thing, like it's real, and, and you know. We were saying last night, we talked late into the night about it. Just like, you can't, cannot be a dick and, and, and live in Nashville comfortably because like people just don't tolerate that here. Like that's Mm -hmm. not what it's about. I mean, obviously there's, there's the side of, you know, every city that is like, or the like, you know, like Mm -hmm. the, I read 20 books a day kind of musician, like, (laughs) but you know. Uh, the cold shower, cold shower guy. That's what Joey calls him. (laughs) Mm -hmm, But, mm -hmm. but you know, here has been like so community based and just like everyone looks out for each other and everyone inspires each other and and pulls from each other's art in a really like respectful, positive way. So like, yeah, man, I mean, that's, that's a huge thing. Was Nashville a city that you. I did over the years. I mean, listen, the first band I ever signed was from Nashville, Jason and the Scorchers. Right. Yeah, oddly, they dropped the Nashville from their name <laughs> funny. at their own at their own choosing. Right. No heavy hand of the man <laughs> in that decision um, because they thought at the time, and this was the early '80s, that it might pigeonhole them as a country art, a quote unquote country artist. Right. So they were just they became Jason and the Scorchers. But over the years, you know, I worked with all sorts of people, um, you know, from Nashville, uh, and always enjoyed my. My, my times uh, in, in Nashville yeah. and have deep, deep respect for a lot of the history and recording studios and, you know, the lefties that figured out a way to make it work inside of Nashville. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a fascinating culture, bit of cultural history. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, a- absolutely. Um, always different chapters, different artists, different labels, different jobs, different times, but yeah, for, 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 for sure. I mean, I always thought it was hard for people that weren't from the Southeast to move there and get accepted there. Sure. I don't think it's the same these days as it might have been in decades past. I but, see that. Um, yeah. you know, it just it was a it was a very tight knit, very insular music publisher, yeah. country music uh, community up until a certain point. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I think it's long since been a much broader based, yeah. um, cultural, cultural place. So yeah, hear. lots of friends who live there. Yeah. Um, yeah. you're going to come see my house. I do want to come see your house when they let me get on a plane again, which is going to be soon. Um, <laughs> I want to come see, I want to come see your house. I would love this. Let me ask you, um, how long was it, um, did you give yourself a break from the record once it was all over in terms of listening to it? Like once we got done with the mixing and the mastering <laughs> and the sequencing and all that sort of like last 10, 20 yards of the deal. Yeah. Did you kind of put it away for a while or, or people wanted to hear it or you um, wanted to hear it in a different car or what, dude, how long did you give yourself a break from it after months and months and months? Of work zero, 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 zero <laughs> minutes and seconds combined. I sp- shit and freak out about it (laughs) every day that's all i did it was like a blessing and a curse because you know the quarantine had struck at its at the peak of like not being able to leave the house had gotten masters back and we're starting to get final mixes so i had nothing to do but cook dinner and watch midnight gospel on netflix and listen to the record 30 times a day and 15 of them tell myself I had made the next pet sounds and the other 15 times be like, I should, 
I should call Lipscomb University back and apologize for not paying my student loans and try to just (laughs) see what I can do. Um, So, yeah, man, I didn't for a long time. I haven't listened to it in a month or two now. I mean, like, obviously some of the more of the singles are coming out, so, like, I'm I'm hearing those. Mm -hmm. But there was a while where every day I was listening to the record just trying to and trying to like mm-hmm. I just force this like relationship with it but perspective was the only thing that really got me there how about you I mean do you listen to the records that your band sent you I mean uh, you know because you go from demos to early versions to uh, you know what about this what about that notes feedback then there's natural breaks and it's mixing then it's thoughts right. on mixing then it's mastering and by then it's like this record's not going to come out for a while, especially with everything that hit us a year ago, we all had to make a decision about what we were going to do with this record. And again, your intuition and instinct was like, you didn't fight it. Like, you know, I was like, it's really hard for somebody to make a record and get told it's not coming out for a year. You know, like we can, we're going to do all this stuff and put out individual songs, but, and it wasn't just because we can't tour. It's like, we should really wait till the world gets on a little bit more stable footing yeah. before we do this. No, but I'm, I'm you know, once you get through it. state, all those months and months and months of the evolution of this stuff, it's like, you've heard it, right? You've heard it so many times. Oh yeah. And there's nothing you can do about it at that point. It's it's, I mean, you made the record. So yeah. But I mean, I, w- I would come back to it, but I would also come back to my sweet spots. Like cinnamon for me is yeah. one of my, that's just like it could be you it could be anybody it's oh, just a song that i adore thank i you. just think that that is just one of those zinger songs oh, that really you know thank would you. get to me i would come back to rose yeah. i would come back to you know just things that like if i'm making a playlist or if i'm in a mood or if i'm putting a little list together for my friends or depending on the mood and the season and the whatever's going on yeah i will pick the songs of yours that just personally mm you know whether they're on the new record or on on earlier stuff but yeah. i think i think it's healthy also to put a record away for a while that you know you're not like for you you got to now you got to go play this record for the next couple of years oh, once yeah. you start playing it that's why it's I like you, you don't want to get too sick too sick of it too yeah. soon yes i'm i'm glad i had this like instinct to be like i should stop <laughs> for a little bit <laughs> hey do you mind uh if i Go pee really fast. I drank a really go, big Go cold for drink. it. Okay, two seconds. Go for it. I'll be right back. Go for it. Remind me to put the put the recording back on when you come back. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yep. Wow. I, I feel right. like a different person. And Sorry. That's grass. No, no, no. We're You're good. rambling. We're rambling and what? rambling. Oh here. my god. Apologize. This is like Okay. I could do this no. all day. But uh yeah. You're no. gonna have to cut out the uh, I called the doctor's office back real quick while Did you were you? doing that. Oh I've man. Got voice recording about vaccine. I'm getting my second vaccine tomorrow. Hey, so. you know. That's exciting. I'm happy about that. That's awesome. Get me, get me back roaming and roaming around again. Yeah, no excuse to come to Music City, baby. Yeah. Uh, how was your first one? The, the first shot. No problem. Yeah. Easy. I mean, it was a little bit. I think I was like, my brain was telling myself I was supposed to feel something. Yeah. But I really wasn't. That's kind what, of thing. That seems to be. But people experience. have different reactions. You know, all even within the same family, within the same gene pool. Some people, young or old, some people are like, yeah, I was knocked out for a day. Other people, no, you know, yeah, no big deal. So cool, man. Are you, uh, are you, where are you going? Is it like a big mass? Yeah, you know, it's the Jacob Javits Convention Center and on the west side of Midtown Manhattan. It's the mega mm. indoor New York State, thousands of people curling around a cordoned off lines <laughs> and National Guard dudes telling you to go here and there. And crazy as hell, you know, it was more of an ordeal to actually find appointments online when the distribution was kind of fits and starts than um than actually going through the process it's a pretty like all for one up upbeat volunteer filled um you know i mean i i I had this it's probably because of latency like uh 
a year, a year's worth of Groundhog Days, and then all of a sudden, oh my, this is a good thing. This yeah. is a really good thing. I was giddy with happiness for that first day, and I, yeah. I think I'll be almost as giddy again um, uh, tomorrow. But most of my family has been able to get access to it and Great. feel good about it. So yeah. you know, it's it's a strange. Uh, it comes with a lot more than just immunity to COVID. I mean, it it opens. We, you know, my friends and I have been talking a bunch about how once we have the opportunity to, um, to not be limited by the pandemic far as like, as far as like socially things go, mm-hmm. like it's going to be really odd, I think for a bit for a lot it of will people. Be. Yeah. To be like, it's going to take a while for it to feel okay. Well, we've talked obviously like not to, um, make light of COVID in any way, but it has become a thing where I, I it, I've had a lot of friends admit that it can become the perfect out a thing that even may be a safe event, a safe mm-hmm. function. You might be around people mm-hmm. who are vaccinated, but I mean, so many times been like, well, you know, we could go get the oil changed in the car, but I mean, you know, I don't know if these guys, yeah. are, you know what I mean? <laughs> like just yeah. things you don't, yeah. it has become sort of an out at times and it's going to be really interesting to go back because I think it's going to hit man like once everyone's going to be getting vaccinated around the same time so like I know within my circle a lot of my friends are starting to get it so like yeah I think it's going to be a crazy I've 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 said since the jump man like I think this summer is going to be really interesting I think it's going to be some summer love vibes especially if uh you know as more and more festivals start to get booked and get to go on safely but like I think it's going to be a really special time once people can see each other again. So how much have you missed the touring thing? Uh, more than anything in the whole world. More than, yeah. Yeah. More than I could have known. I mean, you know, you never thought you probably never thought you'd miss it. Once you get like your eighth night in a row and you're like <laughs> in a van, you're feeling shitty yeah. going like, Oh, well, ugh, can we go home a minute? Oh, but I've said so many times direct quote, like I would give anything to go sleep a dirty mm-hmm. carpet floor next to somebody's like where somebody's dog had peed to like just have that experience again to be back out on the road man like god i'm so eager to do it i like th- that's part of like the difficulty or the the strain of it that i get pleasure from it's literally just like the propulsion just like having something somewhere to be in life like um that I miss the most about it and just the shows. I mean, literally just playing the shows yeah. is so for, for writing too. It's so helpful to write, go share songs with people, see the impact that they have live mm-hmm. and like uh, so much more quickly than I, you can on your own be like, okay, this is going to not like it, it's, it's a, the fastest, fastest like judge of, the validity of what you're writing. So to write and not have an audience to play it for is, is definitely like daunting. And uh, yeah. How about you? I mean, you go to a ton of shows, huh? Yeah. I, what I miss is the travels because if I can pick and choose where I'm going to go catch up with you or catch up with, you know, who, whoever, yeah. you know, that we're working with, I can pick a city and get on a plane and go to a city that I like and have a few hours in the afternoon to go see the things in that city that I love to go and see. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's the same guy. It's a go to the bookstore, go to the gallery, go to the museum, go to the diner, go to the, see what the, those things that inform a city's culture. And those things I, I definitely miss. I miss those weeks in London and running around like a crazy fool, seeing everybody and doing everything. And Oh yeah. I, I, I definitely do miss that travel part of it i don't miss the maybe having to go out on a mm, this might be something but you're gonna know in two minutes but you can't <laughs> leave in two minutes kind of thing <laughs> i how, don't miss that part of it how often were miss, you doing that like how often le- are you still less going and out? less okay. you know le- less and less in new york yeah. i mean if chris were chris were to say to me 
all right, you got to go see this one. Of course you go, yeah. you know, and that led to the Michelle signing. Oh, like, that's you awesome. got to see this. I was like, all right, we're schlepping to the shittiest part of Brooklyn <laughs> to go see something for, in front of six people. And it was amazing. Oh, and let's do this. That's you know? Awesome. Yeah. So the show is still the thing for me, my man. It's yeah. still so important. You have to be able to, and if you're not perfection, in the early times of it, but you show the potential mm. and you show the uniqueness. That's still so important for me. That's why it's been hard. I think we've only signed one artist during this last year because I always wanted to go and see, Yeah, like, what's the show thing? You know, it's that night with you and Leland. It's that night with Michelle. You know, it's all, I can't like ever, all of them, everyone was based on a night, yeah. on a special magic in the air on a given night mm, i miss that very much yeah so but from what me. i see and what i'm hearing it's going to be uh soon enough that you'll be back um back to it yeah i fingers crossed very tightly you know yes yeah man although I, it's hard you lose all track of time like we're here in march and i'm talking about something that maybe not be till for another six months yeah. but you know <laughs> i i definitely have turned to stone of like being excited that 2022 <laughs> is a time when we might be able to tour like i mean if you would have told me that a year ago i would have literally like lost my mind but yeah it does feel crazy time ah, i don't know i think summer's gonna move really quickly just like mm -hmm. I, I feel like just pacing wise and obviously record coming out is gonna make time feel weird and probably quick and slow at the same time but i think once and able to travel more comfortably definitely take some trips here and there i think that will make things go quickly and yeah, yeah i mean I, I do think that it's going to be a an element of like once things are back i think i do want to try this time while there's not much going on to like you know if this is the last year that we're really you know inhibited by this um this situation then like i want to try to learn as much and but that, i mean that's like the the podcast answer but the reality is like yeah it, it is it is groundhog's day like it's so hard to consistently be learning in the same environment so yeah I'm, i can't wait to just go see people how's um how's the podcast going it's great man what do you, well how, what do you think <laughs> I know. I think this is great, but this yeah. is like two buddies talking, you know, that's how I they've said, all felt, man. Luckily, you know, I think we had a parallel inspiration for this idea too. It's like, talk about the making of people are fascinated. And then once it's out into the world for a while and people know it's out into the world and they want to hear like the kind of the behind the scenes and the making of, and who did this and yeah. how did this work? And, I hope so, you know, yeah. so it's always a great thing to chronicle it, to totally. chronicle it. But Sel um, selfishly, I'm just, glad to have a lot of these conversations just like to look back on for memory's sake you know like, yeah like i'm gonna look back on this episode forever and I, i'm sure we'll laugh about this who knows sure. who knows what's gonna where we'll, well be this you know? other thing is you know you make references specific to the day and the time that yeah. you're in yeah you know what are we going to be saying about TikTok in three years? Oh my God, like, I know. Is yeah. there still going to be a thing? Is it going to be another th new thing? Yeah. You know? Wow. But you have all these references, like Ugh. there's probably podcasts where people are talking about how many friends they had on MySpace or something, you yeah, know? Absolutely. Uh, these things become archaic and outdated really, really quickly. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, can be often a, a little source for some yucks um, down the road. But <laughs> yeah. I do think people are fascinated by how the stuff works, you know, and how the stuff gets done. And uh, I think it can be inspiring for people that think that it's just overwhelming. Yeah. Now, if you put some kind of like daily human endeavor behind all this stuff and you sort of demystify it a little bit, it can be encouraging in a way to people that, well, you know, so. think like there's no way I could even imagine functioning in a, in a place like this. Well said, man. Yeah. Very, very well said. I think, to to bridge off of that like i think part of why i was hoping this could you know come into fruition is like i want people to hear um how each individual person who contributed to this record is and how like the thread of them being kind people is like really what's most important to me about this entire thing like the entire 
artist to pursue. Like I, I just, you know, I want to encourage people to like have faith that there are beautiful people out there and that you can, you can make a record like you had said earlier that the stigma of, of the, the big bad label and just like that, you know, yeah. the, the, like I, I want to draw light on how we got to do this and I'm so blessed and so lucky to be getting to do this as a career as a result of, of trusting my really beautiful friends to be, to, you know, to mm-hmm. care and to in turn care about them and, and just want to make something real, um, which is so cool, man. And everyone's their own, completely own flavor of that. Like, I mean, this has been one of the more actual conversational episodes. I mean, like I said, with Hudson, it's like, we're literally just going beep, bap, beep, bap, 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 beep for, you know, for two hours. And Joey and Drew are like, we're just like literally talking regurgitating philosophy books that we read and then john is breaking down you know audio things and everyone's has have has their own beautiful little rhythm to the way they talk and their stories and their how much it's i don't know man it's it's awesome like like i said selfishly it's just really really cool to see to be I, i know i'll be able to look back and be like man how lucky am I to have had these people in my life? Like, yeah, but you know what? You, you gambled with your trust and Mm -hmm. you gambled wisely as it turned out, as it's turning out, as it will continue to turn out. But it took a lot at a young age to put trust in, to put some blind faith into people based on whatever. We like the same records. (laughs) We've been doing it for a while. I like this guy too. I like this guy too. I like this girl too. Yeah. You know, she seems fine. I mean, it wasn't everybody. It wasn't like, you know, uh, what's that were that hundred first dates where everyone was great, <laughs> yeah. but, um, you know, you, you took a lot of confidence, innate confidence in your ju- judgment skills to kind of like, go, yep, him, her, not him, him, not him, not her, yeah. him. And, um, be willing to listen, be willing to stand your ground, be willing to have the challenging conversations, mm. be willing to, you know, stay the course on what you felt the strongest about, be willing to find common ground where that made the most sense. Totally. And I think all these things inform a learning process along the way. And on the eve of putting out an amazing body of work, just think about, you know, it'll be almost three years Mm. since that you were on this diving board in East Nashville, like the, 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 not the literal diving board, but like the, the metaphorical diving board yeah. and all the things that have happened to you and your life since that time. And, um, I just think that, you know, the headlines of my story are the faith that you put in people that you kind of had just met mm. the chance you were willing to take the collaborations on building a great team continue to write good songs in what would have been easily considered to be a dizzying, overwhelming whirlwind Mm. of getting into the business end of this whole proposition and then making a record that took turns along the way into something that you're always going to be super proud of. And it's artistic reach is really the thing. I mean, this is not just, this is not whatever, anybody maybe even you thought it was going to be it's become a whole other proposition in terms of the artful ambition of it all and um yeah i'm uh, i'm lucky and proud that uh chris klein played me some songs (laughs) that somebody dragged him to a show with the u-haul truck parked in front of his nashville house as he was going to move to new york that i said let's go to nashville this is more than a single that i stuck it out as long as i could stick it out um, in the back of that house. Um, I'm grateful for the air conditioning at the hotel that <laughs> saved the rest of my night. And I'm just grateful for your talent and your trust. Well, thank you, man, for all of that. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Bottle, Bottle, Bottle. We did it, guys. That was the episode that we just did. We did it together. I hope you guys um, enjoyed that. Oh, my roommate just told me I left the oven on. 
I should turn it off. I had to. I made some waffles while I was um, doing this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Very stoked for another one coming up soon. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.